I looked through it and like, I haven't murdered anybody. Touch wood. Let alone unintentionally still touch wood. So does this apply to me? Does it apply to any of us? Is it just law or historical things for Israel? Did God just go, hey, Joshua, look, I told Moses this 40 years ago. Come on, let's get on top of it. And is it just for them and that's it? Or is there actually something we can pick out from it and go, hang on, this is, this is still good for me. This is still really, really good for me to look at and go, that, that I understand, that I get. Um, so to kind of make it relevant, let's put ourselves in a... Oh, 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 he's fiddled around with it. There we go. Let's give ourselves a scenario. You have a best friend, right? You love your best friend. You do anything you can with your best friend. You're pretty tight with them. Enjoy life with them. They're exciting. You have real good festivals, real good fun. In fact, people learn about how connected you are with your best friend. Life is awesome together. They may not be your best friend, they might be your neighbor, it doesn't really matter. People just know you and that other person, you, you're, you've got a life together, you combine well together, you do things pretty well together. Maybe one day Patrick says to SpongeBob, let's build something. I need to do my fence over the back. Unfortunately, accidents happen. Fortunately, SpongeBob does something pretty nasty to his friend Patrick. Who knows why? Who on earth knows why SpongeBob did this, how it happened? Were there witnesses? We don't really know. Maybe there were. Maybe Squidward's off the side going, hey, look, you guys, you've just been fools. What's going on? SpongeBob is now in a mad, mad state. He knows his Bible. He's heard Mark 10. He heard Christ say, you shall not kill. And he's like, uh-oh. I've just killed somebody. I've killed a friend. I've killed my friend beside me. I've, I've done something horrible. And the Bible says, you shall not kill. See, the very first occasion of these cities of refuge that God gives us in the Bible is straight after the Ten Commandments. He gives the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20, and he's like, you've got to do these five things. Love me, serve me, love your parents, obey the Sabbath, and then you shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not do da-da-da-da-da. And then right away in Exodus 21, he repeats the same things. He's like, hey, murder is, murder is actually this. Right. Murder is when you go out and you, you willingly strike somebody to die. And then SpongeBob's going, I didn't, I didn't willingly do it. I didn't want to do it. But God also says there in Exodus 21, Let's turn there. Exodus 21 from verse 12. Anyone who strikes a man and kills him shall surely be put to death. Verse 14. If any man schemes and kills another man deliberately, take him away from my altar and put him to death. There's straight away, there are these stipulations already to what murder is. Did you strike him and he died? Yep. That's death. Did you plan to do it? Yep. That's death. And these are immediately after the Ten Commandments. But between those verses, we've missed out the essential. However, if he does not do it intentionally, but God lets it happen, let him flee to a place I will designate. Immediately after God's Ten Commandments, he's like, yes, 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 yes. And then don't, 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 don't. And then straight away, he's like, ah, there's some great areas in this. And it's up to you as my children to figure out how you're going to deliberate over the gray. So SpongeBob reads that. 
It's like, God's told me I've got a place to go to. You, SpongeBob, have a place to run to. I will give you somewhere to go. And if I'm reading Exodus 21 and I'm like, what's it like? How safe is it? How protected am I? Is there food there? Is there sanctuary there? Can I stay there for quite a long time? Who else lives there? What's, what's my life going to be like in that place? Can I just go there and hide out for a few weeks and then come back to my family and hope everything else is good and hunky-dory? What, what's that home like that SpongeBob is trying to get to? Is he going to feel secure? Is he going to feel like that is actually where God has allowed him to go? That's a city of refuge, right? That's why when we come to Joshua 20, God's saying to Joshua, come on, we've got to get on top of this. For those gray areas of, I'm not too sure what your motives were, we've got to put people in those places so that nobody comes out and sort of in blind revenge tries to get them. So what's that city of refuge like? Well, let's go back to Joshua. Have a look at some of the, the facts and figures, if you will, around the cities of refuge. What Joshua and the people decided to do. <clears throat> In Joshua 20, verse 3, um, no, verse 2, sorry, tell the Israelites to designate the cities of refuge. Designate is not like it's not just looking at a map and going, that one, that one, that one, that one, and that one. But it's actually consecrating a place. It's like going out and saying, okay, within Auckland, we've got a few volcanoes, and you've got to choose out of the 70 which ones are special to Aucklanders to run to and take refuge in for the rest of the history of this place. And you just don't go, one, that one, that one over there, that's a bit broken, but that'll do. You consecrate these places for your people. So Israel goes, oh, these six here. And do you think they're just chosen willingly, blindly? Remember, SpongeBob has to get to a safe place. And he has to feel like he's got a chance there. These are incredibly strategic locations. You look at the three on the Israelite side of the Jordan, and they're almost within the middle portions of the land. So you have one right up the north, one fairly reasonably centre, one further down south, and then the same across the other side of the Jordan, while they still help land there. So immediately they've gone, well, hang on, if I murder somebody near Jerusalem, I've got to get somewhere pretty close to Jerusalem. If I accidentally murder somebody further up country, I've got to get somewhere pretty close further up country. Yep, strategy. That'll work. And as we read through verses 7 and 8, they chose Kadesh and Galilee in the hill country, Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim, Hebron in the hill country of Judah. On the east side of the Jordan, they designated Bezer in the desert on the plateau, Ramoth and Gilead in Golan and Bashan. Um, that doesn't come through that well. That top one's a hill in Israel. That's Kadesh. That bottom one, unfortunately, is still not coming through well. That's a desert plateau. That's Beza. Now, if you were anywhere near those cities, and like, that's a hill, isn't it? That's safe enough. Are they up on the hills for defence, or are they up on the hills for security, or are they just kind of up on the hills to make you go, there's it, that's where I'm going? 
the same down at a desert plateau. It's like there's so much space around it. It's like, I know, there, that's where I'm going. Not only located perfectly, but it's like, yep, high in defense or wide out space around it. So you know exactly where to go, how to find it. And there's that sense of security around it too. There's another thing around this, not only where they were put, but how to get there. Come to Deuteronomy 19. <clears throat> From verse two, set aside for yourselves three cities centered locally, uh, located in the center of the land uh, where the Lord your God has given you to possess. So this, I believe, is before they took over the land on the other side of the Jordan too. So these are the first three cities, okay? Build roads to them and divide into three parts the land the Lord your God has given you as an inheritance, so that anyone who kills a man may flee there. Anecdotally, this is the only time in the Bible where they're told to build roads. Right? If you unintentionally, in this gray area of murder, have killed somebody, well, the nation is told, make sure you've got a road to each of these cities. And I, oh, come on. That's not right. Your law says if you murder. Go to verse 6. Otherwise, the avenger of blood might pursue him in a rage and overtake him if the distance is too great and kill him even though he is not deserving of death. In God's mind already, he's like, no, this is a gray area. We don't know your motive. You may not be deserving of death. You may not be deserving of the blind rage of revenge of this avenger of blood. Since he did it to his neighbor without malice, or afterthought, or malicious afterthought, sorry. So there's a precedent established already. Your cities that you put out there for safety and security to give this person a sense of comfort, a sense of protection, they've got to be strategic, they've got to be located close to them, they're going to be in places that you choose, that you consecrate, and you've chosen to put them in high places, in desert places, but now I'm telling you, Make it easy to get there. Um, it's not biblical, and I'm not sure how they come to this idea, but historically Jews also said, well, there are signposts on the road, and then some accounts say these little pillboxes with men inside them are kind of, go that way, that way. And I'm like, yeah, I'd really need that, wouldn't you? It's like if there's a signpost saying Hebron's 200K that way and Kedish is 10K that way, and if it's broken or flipped around the wrong way, well, you're going the wrong direction to get to the closest place. And maybe this avenger of blood is right on your tail already. Maybe. So God is like, hang on, you've got to make absolutely certain you can get to that city quickly and safely in case you are not deserving of death. There's one other point that comes through. Who lives in these cities? They've chosen six cities within the land. Who's going to be there when you get to that city? Is it just a few other Israelites? Is it boxes and lines and walls? Is it deserted? Come to Numbers 35. <clears throat> uh, verse 2, command the Israelites to give the Levites towns to live in from the inheritance the Israelites will possess and give them pasture lands around the towns. And they'll have towns to live in and pasture lands for their cattle, flocks, and all their other livestock. So the Levites were given 48 cities within this chapter. And then they're given land for their pasture, for their herds, and their flocks to live and survive, to actually exist as Levites within the lands. 
And then it carries on. Six of the towns who give the Levites in verse six will be cities of refuge to which a person who has killed someone may flee. In addition, give them 42 other cities. So of those 48 cities, God says, well, the six that you make cities of refuge, those are Levite towns. Uh, well, I'm this great area of sin and I've got a place to go to. It's high up or desertish and it's got a road that leads to it. And I get there, who lives there? God's chosen people who teach his law, who follow his religion, who fulfill his sacrifices, who essentially live that godly life of representation to me, an Israelite. That's where I'm going to. Not just for protection from a city, but you'd hope as well for education in God's truth. Um, I'm glad Josh read out of his translation. We'll come to it in a minute, but there's a perfect phrase that came out, and you'll see why. But who could go to these cities? Who could actually flee there? Well, Joshua says anyone. Not just in his right. Verse 9, he says any foreigner living in that land. You're not a believer? Doesn't matter. It happened in the land, and if you're in the land, you can go there. The same in Numbers. Numbers says the same thing. These places of refuge are for the Israelite, for the foreigner, and the settlers among them. This is an opportunity for security and safety for anybody who may have unintentionally murdered. Now, what are they fleeing from? This is a avenger of blood. Right. Now, this avenger of blood is um, it's acting as a kinsman. So I know Deuteronomy says, hang on, this guy might be out there in blind rage, and if he catches you, well, that's it. It's, this, it's the act of kinsman. The Hebrew phrase for avenger of blood is actually, it's the act of kinsman or buying back, rescuing. Right, so when you think of Boaz, for instance, was acting as the nearest kinsman. He was doing his family duty as the kinsman because his elder brother was like, no, nah, not for me. So Boaz steps up and says, yep, I'll do that duty. So the avenger of blood within the story is fulfilling a, a family duty. Now, obviously, he can choose, like the elder relative in that Boaz story is like, no, nah, I'm not doing it. Maybe this avenger could also say, no, nah, I'm not doing it today. But then there are instances where it's taken further. So there's a verse in 2 Samuel 14, um, verse 7, around about there, where the entire family decides to set out on this vengeful path of justice. Right? So God is saying, okay, I'm giving this family a chance to avenge or act as a a system of retribution. So it's your family right. You don't have to do it. And then in some cases, further down the road, other families are swing. Yep, taking it fully out of context. So that's who SpongeBob is fleeing from. Some designated person that has now got the opportunity or the obligation to go after him and he can take his life. What do you do to get inside? You've arrived at the gate of the city. What do you do to get inside? Joshua 20 verse 4. He'll stand at the gate and present his case to the elders. Remember who lives there? They're Levites. They're the teachers of the law. They're the people who understand God's truth the best within Israel. You've just, out of full-blown adrenaline, run to this place that is like, I can get safety here. Maybe this avenger of blood is right on your heels. Maybe he saw it go down in the fields and he's like, Patrick was the best friend to me. I'm going to get you. 
And in your mind, you're busy going, where the heck is it? Where's the closest one? There it is, and off you go. And then still you're trying to think, how do we get inside? How do we convince those Levites inside what I did was an accident? Imagine if you're a stranger or a foreigner. You don't have any friends or family to stand up for you. You don't have anybody that can speak for your character. What are you going to do? You need to get inside. But you also need to stand at the gate and plead your case. Is it frantic screaming? Just knocking on that door, let me in! Here's where Josh's version was amazing. Picks up that phrase, I think New King James. Absolutely brilliant. Karen and Joshua, and he says, they will take him into the city as one of them. I've just murdered somebody, and I'm not a Levite. I've pleaded my case through anguish and adrenaline and tears, and they've now let me into the inside, and they're not saying, hey, down the back corner, please. They're saying to you, you are now one of us. You're one of us, here's a place to sleep, here's some food, sit down, calm down, we will teach you about what God is telling us about this entire situation. And they shall not deliver him under the slayer. How long does it take for that slayer to turn up to the door? Do they shut the doors as soon as you're inside? Obviously, that slayer is running circles around the city. Where the heck is he? I know he's in here. Let him out. Give him to me. You become like a Levite. And they will not deliver you up. <clears throat> How do you feel now that you're inside? It's like, well... Okay, I, I'm in the city. Now there's another period of judgment. I've already pleaded my case at the gates. Now there's another judgment to come. And the death of the high priest. Maybe I've thought about that as I'm running down to that city. It's like, yeah, this guy, he, the high priest, he's been in power for like 40 years. He's only gotten given six months. I'll be home, sweet. Maybe he's been there for a month. He's a new high priest. You go, nah, I can't do that. There's a cave over the hill there. Are you weighing up those thoughts as you get there? Making those deliberate decisions? So what's this other judgment? This other stage of judgment. You see, you've already been judged at the gates to be let in. And yet Joshua says there's another judgment. Well, Numbers 35. Let's go back to Numbers 35. <clears throat> Numbers 35, it goes through the whole process as well and then explains what murder is and what accidental is and how you'll be judged against those principles. So in verse 24, the assembly must judge between him and the avenger of blood according to those regulations. Did he mean to do it? Was he hostile? Was he angry? Was there malice in it? Did he really hate that person? This whole period of judgment speaks to your character, doesn't it? It's not just the event of the, the death and the murder or the manslaughter. It's speaking to your character, who you are as a person. Oh, come on, he hated Zach for years. 
He's just looking for a chance to get rid of him. Like, yeah, they all speak up, I know, like the whispers going around. If you're a stranger, you've got nobody to stand there and defend you. It's your life that is then put on trial in front of these people. Now, I'm not sure exactly who this congregation is. It appears that it could be either the region or the town where this event took place. Maybe where that family is of the person that's um, unfortunately died. So that's the congregation that is now out trying to weigh up. Was there malice? Was there hostility? Was there anger? Was there bitterness? Or was it entirely accidental? And who's there with you at the time? Verse 25, it's the priests again. Mm. The assembly must protect the one accused of murder from the avenger of blood and send him back to the city of refuge to which he fled. And he must stay there until the death of the high priest. That assembly, I just get this weird sort of vision of like this, this cohort around you is like, brings you in and like 10 guys just coming, yeah, got him, got him, got him. And then all these sort of angry family members, get him, they're like, no, protecting them, right? And then they've got to protect you all the way back to the city of refuge too. They're listening to this whole thing as it goes on. They are not the judges here. It's the town or the congregation besides them. So you've had that judgment and maybe that judgment has then declared you actually, yes, it was unintentional. You're allowed to go back to the city, back to that life as a Levite, back to figuring out if this is truly for you or not. There are some things that you shouldn't really be doing as well. Once you're in that city, verse 26, if the accuser ever goes outside the limits of the city of refuge to which he has fled and the avenger of blood finds him outside the city, the avenger may kill the accused without being guilty of murder. Maybe you're back there again. It's like, well, standing over the parapet, there's mum and dad. There's son one, son two. Well, let's make it socially acceptable for today. There's my husband. And I've got a choice to make. I just sneak out the back door, just come, come around to the back. That kinsman is still watching out, waiting for you. He's still there, ready. Because that's his family obligation. You cannot leave that city until the death of the high priest. Um, for the purposes of this exhort, we're not really going to touch on the obvious because I'm sure you will get the death of the high priest. What does this mean to us today then? What, what are some of the things that we can take away from the cities of refuge? See, I haven't murdered, but what do I unintentionally do? Paul says in Romans, there are some things I do not understand what I do. What I would to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. Some things I don't want to do, and unintentionally, I do them. Sometimes human nature just flares right up, and these sins happen. I don't murder, true, but I definitely unintentionally do other things. What about that race with the Avenger? I've got to flee to that city, right? I have to get away to safety. Well, he carries on in Romans. That wretched man that I am, that race against sin and death to find life. Who will deliver me from this body of death? Who will deliver me from this body of anguish? That continual chase of death that comes up on us. 
that continual fleeing of sin. That searching for a place that can give us safety and sanctuary. Well, if I get to that city, if I get to the gates, I'm pleading to enter in, I'm pleading to get into that sanctuary, into that, that protection that God offers. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Jesus Christ, for the law of the life-giving spirit in Christ has set you free from the law of sin and death. You've stood before Christ, before God, and you've confessed who you are and what you've done. We've all made our confession of baptism. We've all stood before Christ and before God and confessed what our actions were, why we did them unknowingly or why we did them willingly even, and realized that we need to be in that city within those walls of protection. <clears throat> How about those judgments before others? So we're now in the family, we're now in within the city. And yet there was that other judgment before the congregation, isn't there? Those who live according to the flesh, carrying on Romans, have their outlook shaped by things of the flesh, but those who live according to the spirit, their outlook shaped by things of the spirit. Our motives and our morals, our ethics, all our actions and this new life that we choose to live. People see that, they witness that. Are we choosing to live by the flesh? Well, we're now in the city. So we're hopefully choosing to live by the spirit. And people judge us on those. Are oh, you religious? You shouldn't be doing that. What are you doing? You can't drink, you can't do that. It's like, yep, they've got their own view of what religion and Christianity might be. We do too, from how we choose to understand what God is teaching us. What are those continual judgments between us and people outside, outside of the walls of that city? So we now have sanctuary within. We now have sanctuary within that place that has a road that led up to it. Did we find that road easily enough? Do we find that city fun and invigorating, stimulating? Do we understand now that we're living as Levites? We're actually living as God's family within the walls of that refuge. Do we feel that now? How great the love of the Father has been lavished on us that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. Do we feel that we're Levites now, living as the children of God?